All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for another CNCF live webinar, Building a Cloud Native CI-CD Pipeline. I'm Libby Schultz, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm going to read our code of conduct and then hand things over to Jason Smith and Muriel McCabe, both with Google. <clears throat> a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're unable to speak as an attendee, but there is a chat box where you can list all your questions, and we will get as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct and please be respectful of all fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They're also available via your registration link and the recording will be available on our online programs YouTube playlist, which I just linked in the chat. With that, I will hand things over to Jason and Muriel to kick off today's presentation. <laughs> there, there we go. go. There we go. <laughs> My uh, computer was just like, I don't, don't want to work right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you for the introduction, Libby, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, as mentioned, we are going to be talking about building a cloud native pipeline, uh, CICD pi uh, platform, rather. Uh, and it is going to be very open source, very heavy, and we hope uh, very cloud native heavy, and we hope you enjoy it. Uh, just to get a few introductions out of the way. Uh, looks like I'm having information, so my camera get, keeps getting turned off, so we'll just do it this way. Um, so just a brief level of introduction here. I'm Jason Smith. You can call me Jay. I'm an App Eco Specialist uh, Customer Engineer at Google Cloud. You can find all of my links, and I, there's probably a few I need to update at Linktree. Uh, my peer reviewer is Winry. She is often you know, heard uh, barking in my meetings or sitting in my lap. Right now, she's sitting at my feet. And Muriel, I will turn over to you to introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Jay. And thank you as well, Libby, for having us. My name is Muriel, and I am an app eco specialist as well. Um, there at the bottom is my peer reviewer, Orion, uh, Russian Blue, who uh, loves to, at very inopportune times, walk across the keyboard, but of course he's just doing that to make sure that all my code is linted and sanitized. So thank you all again for being here. And just as a final note, um, we are uh, excited to be here. Our opinions are our own and not necessarily, necessarily reflective of our employer. So we can uh, jump right in and get started. So today, as mentioned, we are going to be covering a cloud native approach to CI/CD, but there are, you know, very many things that fall under this world of cloud native and CI/CD. So we are going to scope that pretty uh, definitively uh, and look at some specific tooling in that space, uh, in particular Argo CD and Tecton. Uh, and then from there, we're actually going into some live demos. As Libby mentioned, we will try to get to all of the questions at the end, but just since we want to make sure we can cover all of our material, we will uh, take those once we have finished. All right, so let's dive right in. So as mentioned, we're going to kind of scope down within the world of both cloud native and CI CD. In particular, what we wanted to focus on is deploying containerized applications to Kubernetes in the cloud. So when we're looking one at this very container first approach, and then also as far as the platform goes, looking at these hosted or uh, cloud uh, running Kubernetes instances. So let's start with the Kubernetes bit of it. So I, I, I love this because it's it's one, the simplicity, the complexity, and the beauty of Kubernetes all in one. When we're looking at the power of the system, you know, hey, it's just a bunch of YAMLs. How hard can that be? Well, for all of you folks that have been running Kubernetes in different capacities, uh, you uh, probably have experienced firsthand just how not easy this might be. But when we're also looking at cloud native and CI CD, 
uh, that's actually one of the powers of being able to have your configurations and your applications defined in code is that ability to take those YAML templates actually now will empower you to be able to uh, do a lot of really great things when it comes to looking at continuous delivery and continuous integration. Um, so moving on, um, now when we're looking at the world of DevOps, uh, you know, there are also very many things that fall under this, this DevOps world. We're looking at this slice that in particular falls under the realm of both release engineering and DevOps, um, particularly the continuous delivery and deployment part. Uh, but every team implements this in a slightly different way. Uh, and this means very different things across teams. So for some, we're looking at some, some different processes uh, such as you know, agile or standups or continuous integration. So, well, what does DevOps actually look like when it comes down to your organization? So as mentioned, we're, we're going to now uh, uh, take a quick definition check. These are actually all part of the glossary or these have come from the CNCF glossary. It's an open source glossary. You can actually contribute definitions, but really these are different terms that fall under the cloud native world. So when we're talking about things like continuous integration, integrating code changes as regularly as possible, this is really looking at the build portion of your uh, CI, CD and release pipeline. So uh, building your images, going in that inner loop of development where you're taking your code, committing it to your repository, having builds generated, doing testing and so on. And ideally this is something that is happening on an ongoing basis, very frequently, multiple times per, per day. Now, what we're going to be focusing on, as I mentioned today, is really on this second half of the CI CD pipeline, looking at one, there's the continuous delivery portion of it, where now it's taking those changes and the code that has been created in this inner loop of development, and now deploying that into your environment where you can actually see and test out the, the code or see uh, the application running. Uh, and then a step further beyond uh, the other CD, <laughs> continuous deployment, is now taking that software and being able to create methods and processes to run that software into production. So we'll continue on. Oh, back one. Okay, there we go. Uh, so now when we're looking at some of these characteristics or guidelines around um, cloud native DevOps or cloud native CI CD pipelines, um, one portion, which, you know, uh, so one portion is GitOps. And you may be saying right now, while we're talking about our, our code, code and build, doesn't GitOps have to do with infrastructure? Well, yes. So one really key principle is now that your build and your release systems are actually systems of their own that need to be managed in certain ways. And to be able to manage those systems using a lot of the same methodology, such as infrastructure as code and so on, to be able to ensure the a resilience, the scaling and so on of your build systems themselves. So that's another key component is that you have this tooling that can also be managed in very much the same way as your code is managed. Another really a big principle, which also kind of falls uh, in line with the GitOps methodology is now looking at having a separation of both your application source code. So the actual functions and features and logic of your application and the application configuration. So maybe your destination, if we're looking now at the Kubernetes world, the repositories with the actual manifests uh, and so on, because now your application is a little bit more than just the code that you're running, you actually have configurations such as the services, the endpoints, any of your config maps and secrets and configurations as well. So these are all components that now are decoupled from your application source code. Um, when we're looking at the centralized DevOps tooling, um, it kind of goes back to just the GitOps and being able to have all of your configurations and infra defined as code. Um, we're taking a very container centric development approach uh, just to really lie into the portability and the reusability of your systems. Um, and essentially what we're looking at is with this portability, being able to now decouple certain parts of your CI CD pipelines where your, your build and your deployment pipelines don't necessarily have to be tightly coupled. These can be decoupled as well. 
Automation, uh, you know, as another key DevOps principle across the board is also very important in the cloud native world, the frequent merges and deploys. Um, and additionally, um, looking at just that movement of now being able to shift left and, and do more of the testing and security early on in uh, the build process rather than after the fact when something is running already in production. That security and testing is now going to be baked in across the board. Thank you, Muriel. And so one thing we want to talk about that's out of scope, at least for this conversation, not for the concept of DevOps in general, is uh, like deployment strategies. We're not going to really talk about blue, green, canary rolling updates, uh, deploying functions, ML, data pipelines. DevOps is kind of a, a large scope. So a lot of times the concept of DevOps can be integrated into other forms uh, of computing, not just in terms of deploying applications, but functions, uh, ML data pipelines. We'll talk a little bit about that conceptually, but not go into depth. And we're not gonna talk about infrastructure automation. So, you know, uh, infrastructure as code, anything like that. Uh, this is all stuff that can be covered over DevOps. You know, we we might do a um, you know webinar series or blog series on it later, but for the purpose of this conversation, we won't be covering that. So we've been talking about DevOps. This is called a CI/CD platform webinar. What what what's the difference? One thing I always point out is DevOps isn't really a tool. Like when we hear the word, we often think of it as a tool or, you know, you might go on to LinkedIn and look up DevOps engineer jobs, stuff like that. DevOps is really more of a philosophy and a platform, a philosophy and an execution of said philosophy into a set of tools and whatnot. It's how we decide to deploy applications and how do we make that work in such a way that it is repeatable. That's why we have kind of this infinity symbol here where we go from planning to coding, building, test, release, deploy, operate, monitor, and then we start all over again. And that's how we continue to reiterate and improve our application, fix bugs, all of that, and continue to have that application constantly evolving over its life cycle. And then also integrating new light applications or new workloads into the life cycle over for our entire stack. This is a non-exhaustive list by any extension of the imagination of a bunch of DevOps tools provided by devopscube.com. And this kind of gives you an idea of how extensive DevOps is as a philosophy, as a platform. Like these are the tools that we use to execute DevOps within our organization. In, in the same way that we might use certain uh, um, systems, networking tools and whatnot to in integrate or to execute infrastructure in our system. So uh, again, non-exhaustive list, uh, but you know, you might see a lot of these names that you've seen before. Most of these are open source, but there's also proprietary stuff out there, but we love open source here at CNCF and Google. And personally, I've been a huge open source fan for decades now. Uh, so yeah, this just gives you a quick idea. You might see here that towards the top, there are two particular ones, continuous integration, continuous delivery. Those are what we're going to focus mainly on today in the DevOps stack. And I also took this screen grab here. So if you go to landscape.cncf.io, you kind of get this, uh, as I call an eye chart of all the different projects and companies that are supporting uh, the entire landscape of CNCF. Here in particular are the various companies and projects that make up the application uh, development and CI CD toolkit. Some of these, again, you might be very familiar with. Uh, two in particular we're going to talk about today are Tecton and Argo. But any one of these is great. We're not necessarily saying that Tecton and Argo the end all be all whatever works for your organization that's why we say devops is a philosophy versus like an actual platform we don't say these are the absolute tools you need to use this is how we believe in using it figure out the culture of your company figure out the culture of your organization and then figure out what tools exist that fit that culture 
And as you see, there's a large tool list of cloud native tools. And this is kind of a high level idea of what we see the CI/CD process looking like or the DevOps process looking like, which CI/CD is part of, using a variety of different open source tools. So almost all coding begins in some kind of IDE, whether it is hosted, web-based, or on your own laptop. So something like VS Code or IntelliJ, but then there's like, a, you know, repel it and a bunch of different tools within GitHub, GitLab. Then you have your source control, whatever you choose to use, GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, GitT, um, so on and so forth. There's deploy. As you can see, we have Argo and Tecton, but there's other tools out there, a large list of tools that you would have seen in the previous slide. Packaging and storing, security, runtime, operate. Uh, so runtime, Kubernetes, maybe you want to deploy serverless, you use Knative, Dapper, Kita. Uh, these are all open source tools, by the way, or open source concepts as well. Now. This is all a lot of words that I'm throwing out here. What does all of this mean? Well, when we talk about cloud native, you know, there, I, we can have a huge, long definition about it. But the way I always see it is it's containerize all things. Like, yes, that is a very reductive definition, but it's an apt def, uh, definition. When we talk about cloud native, we are talking about making containers and deploying them because when it when applications are containerized they are faster they're you're bringing your own runtime and they are easy to make portable across different platforms whether it is kubernetes cloud run um yeah, you know uh, another containerized platform as we're starting to see that the docker the, the docker oci image runtime is a very popular use case so there's a lot of different ways you can use it uh, so when we talk about cloud native CI CD, we're essentially using containers to build containers. So everything's container. And so, yeah, we, we are using a lot of the containers to build containers. That's what you'll see with like Argo and Tecton as we dive into the demo. We, the different steps to actually build your application are containers themselves. And with that, I'm going to actually turn it back to Muriel to talk a little bit about Argo. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jay. Um, so let's get into Argo. And we're going to go through things just from a very introductory and high level here. But the best place to start is actually what is Argo? Because Argo, we're focusing today specifically on the Argo CD version. But the Argo project itself is a collection of open source tools that were purpose built for Kubernetes for everything from running workflows, managing clusters, and so on, but using a very Kubernetes centric point of view. And I'll talk about that a little bit shortly. So the Argo CD portion is really looking at this declarative GitOps model for continuous delivery within uh, Kubernetes. Uh, but there are also some other components, such as workflows, which is the workflow engine. Uh, using like the directed graphs and step-based workflows, uh, Argo events for event-based dependency management, and Argo rollout. So all of these tools can be used on their own or in coordination with each other, but they are all projects that are within the Argo Foundation or the Argo project itself. Um, so back when, so uh, really briefly, uh, a little bit of the history behind Argo it was originally developed at Intuit, kind of by way of um, a startup that had gotten absorbed. So within Intuit, this project had started, officially was uh, added to the CNCF in 2020 and graduated as of the end of last year in December. I got several contributors on GitHub. It has been really, really gaining a lot of popularity due, I, in my opinion, to a lot of this very Kubernetes-centric approach so that you're using the same and similar constructs to be able to manage uh, your applications within Kubernetes. Um, and essentially, when we're looking at these Kubernetes native tools, it's it's using that same KRM or the Kubernetes resource model controllers, custom resources, and so on. Um, and a little bit about the, the naming history, uh, uh, Argo is actually the name of that Greek ship that carried Jason and the Argonauts on, on the quest, coming, uh, staying in line with a lot of the Greek naming conventions within the Kubernetes world. Uh, so that is actually a photo of the literal Argonaut, which is actually also uh, a, or an octopus. and. 
Um, you can read more about it. It's a very interesting animal. Uh, so Argo CD, as mentioned, will focus on the CD part of this, where we're looking at all of your application definitions, the configurations, everything within that environment is declarative and version controlled. So the same structure, the same YAMLs and so on that you will be accustomed to seeing and using when you're managing your application code and your applications themselves are going to be the same pieces that you can use to manage the application definition, your pipeline definition, and so on. So this creates a lot of the ability for automation, auditing, you have the single source of truth for your configuration. And then also, if, even from a resilience point of view, when you're looking at being able to restore your configurations, um, all of these kind of live in this, this version controlled system. So you do have your backup within source control. And also you have the ability to get more granular as far as your actual access to the systems themselves for your roles and so on, determining who can act, who actually needs to have access to the, the Kubernetes um, clusters themselves versus just to the code. So there's a lot of real flexibility there within the Argo CD world. And if we page on, and I, I guess as another note as well, this allows for decoupling from your CI system. So within workflows and everything, you are able to, to do continuous integration. But for example, if you got a team and you're already invested in things like Jenkins or you have things to do your build systems themselves, these can remain decoupled where uh, now you have a tool that has access and is set up within your cluster to be able to manage your actual deployment into Kubernetes. And the way that this really works and where this is really powerful is that you actually now don't have to get a lot of these creds and so on set up and uh, secrets access to your cluster and everything within your build systems. Your build systems don't need to have that connectivity back into the cluster, which now creates that additional level of security, reducing your risk footprint. With Argo, you now have the server components, the API server repository server and application controller that are living within your cluster, um, are directly within your cluster. And so now it's doing this sort of outbound pool-based model um, and it makes it very flexible for being able to manage, as I mentioned, your, your security. Um, and uh, if we go on to the next slide, um, um, Actually, so I'll talk about the architecture and patterns in a sec. Can we go to two forward? Oh, one, yeah, one more. So um, I have these reversed. So when we're looking at the patterns now of being able to manage your Argo, you can actually have a few different models of, of looking at this installation. You can have that entire um, server architecture as, as shown previously deployed within your application cluster and deployed directly into that cluster. Uh, itself, and you can have the, uh, your each instance separated that way, or you can have a single, maybe a main instance of Argo deployed in a dedicated cluster, and then your various other clusters that are being managed by Argo now just need to have these service accounts that communicate back with a dedicated cluster. So you could have this distributed model where you have a centralized uh, deployment system that now is able to manage multiple clusters uh, as well. So you have a few of these installation modes. And there also is, uh, there are various services out there like Acuity and so on that, that do offer fully managed um, Argo CD as well, so that now it's just using this sort of agent-based model to be able to manage your infrastructure. Uh, and we'll go into a little bit about what this looks like in the demo as well. Uh, so I think if we can go back one, I'm a little bit out of order. <laughs> when we're looking at some of the key resources that you use to be able to define your, your uh, pipelines within Argo, there's this concept of an application, and you can see a sample of that on the right. And this application is essentially an instance of, you know, whatever that, that application or that, that business application is. It's essentially just defining the Git source and the destination namespace. So it's kind of as simple as that. Just where do your actual manifests or definitions of the application live? And I'll talk a little bit about the different forms that that can uh, take. And then also what cluster should that go to? So it's using this very declarative Git-centric model. Um, now you can do things like control via pull request and Git access. 
who can deploy to certain environments and so on without necessarily having to configure all of that RBAC or the roles and permissions within your Kubernetes cluster. Um, then we also have the idea of a project, which is essentially a group of applications, uh, a repository, which is now the, the source repository. As you can see here, it's just using a GitHub repo, but the repository and the credentials are defined there as a Kubernetes secret. And then when you're looking at the manifest themselves that are in your source repository, that can take the form of just your standard YAML, or you can use things like customize, Helm, JSONnet to uh, use as your application definitions. All right, um, as far as, as the setup goes, it's actually pretty quick and straightforward. The documentation on the Argo CD site is really great, so kudos to them. Uh, but essentially, once you have a, a cluster that you'd like to get this set up on, then it's just a matter of creating the namespace, applying the, the YAML, which is here on the Argo project GitHub, and then you're essentially up and running. Uh, you can pull that down and customize it, or if you wanted to version lock it and pin it, but this is really just kind of the, the quick start. All right. Um, and then as far as using Argo, and we'll really dial into this when we demo, um, there are kind of three, three main modes. Um, one, there's an Argo CD command line tool that allows you to be able to interact with the Argo CD server, view your applications and lists and so on, uh, which is really flexible for being able to do just some scripting. Uh, there is also a dashboard that is built in. So once you get that Argo a server deployed as we did in the last step. It's just a matter of exposing um, either through, you know, some type of ingress or, you know, port forwarding or so on, but that dashboard is already built in and available for you to have a UI based method of interacting with the server. And then there is the Argo API as well. Uh, and so from here, I believe we will hand over to Jay to talk over uh, Tecton. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, we talked a little bit about Argo. Now we're going to talk about Tecton. Uh, these two are not necessarily exclusive from each other. In fact, I have seen uh, a lot of different industries and you'll see a lot of examples online where people actually use them together. They use Tecton for the CI portion and Argo for the CD portion of their DevOps pipeline. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about Tecton. Uh, this is actually a pretty famous tweet by Kelsey Hightower when he was talking about Kubernetes. He said, Kubernetes is a platform for building platform. It's a place to start, not the end game. So it's not the idea that, you know, oh, I have Kubernetes and it's ready to be deployed and all my applications are going to be there. Instead, think of it as the building blocks to build the platform that you want to host your application rather than starting from the ground up and using you know, bare metal servers and trying to write your own orchestration tool to build that platform. Uh, another way to think of it is if you're trying to build, you know, uh, build a, a model a house or something like that, it'd be much easier if you got you know, an, an instruction booklet and, and the balsa wood and stuff versus having to go out into the forest and cut down your own tree and you know, cut down the, the lumber in order to make the sticks. So this is the platform for building platforms, not the end game. In the very same way, I always try to say that Tecton is a platform for building your DevOps tool, not the DevOps tool itself. So it gives you the same basic primitives that you will see with Kubernetes to build on top of Kubernetes, specifically for the use case of DevOps or CI CD. So the idea is that it's composable, declarative, reproducible, and cloud native. Everything in Tecton is a container. It sits on top of Kubernetes. It is becoming an industry standard and it's already utilizing Kubernetes API. So it is standard in that sense. And it's also extensible. It's declarative, everything's a YAML. And there's a lot of different benefits to it that we'll dive into. Oh, and even dogs love it. So we have a little Tecton cat there and left it on the bed while I was doing something and she decided that it was her new toy. And I think she is right now building a pipeline to help get her some, uh, get her some of her dog food into the bowl without me there. 
Now, one thing I want to point out, Tecton is part of the CD Foundation. Some of you may have heard of it, some of you may not. You can think of it as a sibling foundation to the CNCF. So both are kind of child foundations to the Lynx Foundation. So they work together, but whereas CNCF has kind of a larger overarching viewpoint on cloud native technology, CD Foundation's really focused on uh, on continuous delivery and continuous delivery exists in and outside of the cloud. It can exist on premise, it can exist for ML ops, it can exist for data pipelines, so on and so forth. So that's why people decided, the Linux Foundation decided that there's a benefit of having a separate foundation specifically for CD. Um, and Tecton was kind of, if you will, one of the founding products around it in the same way that you could say Kubernetes was kind of the cornerstone product around or cornerstone project around CNCF. Tecton actually used to be a part of Knative, which is a CNCF uh, project uh, as, under the name of Knative Build. Uh, but eventually, the the creators, and this is kind of a very short story, uh, decided that you know there's so much to be gained from what Knative Build was becoming. It really should be its own project. So it evolved into Tecton as we see it today. Tecton has multiple components. This is actually not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the key ones. And this is actually growing because some of these did not even exist at the earliest stages. What most people know Tecton for, and if you were to like say, hey, what's Tecton? People would assume pipelines in most cases, and that wouldn't be wrong. But there's also a dashboard, uh, a CLI tool, Chains, which is supposed to help with, uh, with your secure software delivery. Triggers, which is event listening, so automatically trigger if uh, if X event takes place, and of course a catalog, which we will talk briefly about later. To give an idea of what Tecton Pipelines is, which is part of what we're going to be talking about, Pipeline is the main CI/CD component. And uh, so, what it makes up a pipeline? So you have a step. Each step is like the individual thing that happens in a CIC workflow, like run a pie test on a Python application, pull something from GitHub, push to a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, task is a collection of the different steps that are initiated in a single pod. So, you know, a pod a step will be that container that executes in the pod, and then a pipeline is a collection of tasks. One way to look at it uh, is, so here you have the pipeline, and this is the entire thing. Like, I want to take my code from GitHub, do what I need to do with it, you know, test it, containerize it, push it to my Kubernetes cluster. So that's the overall pipeline. That's the thing I want to happen. The task are the individual items that take place or the individual actions that take place that each represent a separate Kubernetes pod. So you have a task for... Uh, for, you have a task for um, pulling from GitHub. You have a task for containerizing. You have a task for running tests. And then each task is a different step. So that gives you a kind of an idea. We're going to also talk about the trigger component, which is for eventing. So in a, you know, if it's just me working on a personal project, executing the runs of each pipeline isn't that big of a deal. Uh, if I'm a large organization, I want some automation. I want it to execute based on X, Y, Z events. So we have what we call the trigger, the, the trigger component for Tecton that works together with the pipelines. So you'll have an event listener, which is a CRD that, that enables a declarative way to collect the HTTP events with JSON payloads. payloads. Uh, there is now a, a new protocol called CD events. If you're at all familiar with cloud events, it's very similar. So trying to create a, 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 not a different type of protocol for cloud communication, a different type of protocol for CD uh, communication, we are starting to see a lot of that being integrated now. Uh, trigger template are resources uh, for the trigger. So, you know, declaring things such as the secret that I'm going to use to pull from GitHub and stuff like that. And then the binding binds the trigger uh, template with the events and passes the parameters from the JSON payload. So, so excuse me for the item here, but this we'll, we'll look at a real one later. But this kind of gives you an idea of what a task with steps look like. This might look very familiar to you. It's just simple YAML. This looks very similar to what I would do if I were declaring uh, something in, in, in Kubernetes. Same thing with the pipeline. 
very simple. I'm declaring all the different steps, uh, the different tasks that are supposed to execute in order. And it's pluggable. And that's one of the big things too. Each one of these tasks that make up a pipeline is an individual component and it can just be moved from pipeline to pipeline across different projects. In fact, earlier I mentioned this catalog. So Tekton has a catalog available today that is a bunch of reusable and tested. So there, there have been testing uh, done on it by the community. So you, there is some, you, you can rely on using them. They are, they are the containers that are their tasks that already have uh, do a specific item. So if I want to deploy a 10% canary, if I want to do a canary analysis, if I want to deploy two Kubernetes, pull from GitHub, instead of having to rewrite those tasks from scratch, I can go to the catalog, pull them down. They're probably already 80% of the way there. I tweak it with my specific branch or whatever my variables or specific use cases are, and boom, it's ready to go. So now we're going to take a quick moment to do demos. There's two demos here, one for uh, Tekton and one for Argo in the interest of time, because we do want to give you a chance for, tech, uh, for questions. I am going to uh, do this really quickly. So bear with me right here as I get this going. Let's see. Oh, let's just do a window here. Uh, all right. Let me expand this too. Uh, so this is Google Container Engine or Google, it used to be called Container Engine, Kubernetes Engine. Uh, so uh, this is, you know, we're Googlers, so we use it. But I want to be very clear that this will work on any kind of Kubernetes platform. That's not just limited to Google. Uh, it, any kind of Kubernetes platform will work. I also want to highlight that Google is you know, very committed to Tekton. We are involved in its development and, our, you know, we, we want to see it succeed. So here are some ideas of what you would see with the Tekton, pipe, uh, Tekton pipeline. All of these are actually on the demos too. If you go to the uh, Tekton GitHub, the Tekton triggers and the Tekton pipelines, you can find a lot of these demos as well and play with them. But as you can see, you know, this is just a Kubernetes object called a pipeline using the Tekton API. I can go ahead and just name my pipeline, put a namespace, I set parameters, uh, what I want it to do, uh, where it's going to pull from, all that good stuff. Uh, build the Docker image. So right here, it's going to deploy something called Event Display. And it's actually going to build that Docker image using Canico, which if you're familiar with the project, it's a way to build containers in your Kubernetes cluster rather than having to you know, like pull it down to a VM and execute Docker build or, or uh, whatever build tool you utilize. Uh, and then it deploys it as a pod. So here are all the different steps for my, uh, or the different tasks and steps, as you can see. So if we actually compose it or decompose it, we have a task and each part here is a step. So this is actually a singular step task where it runs kubectl on the, this specific item. Um, I create an ingress. There's some RBAC settings that you can set up that you will find uh, in the documentation. I have an event listener here, which is listening for my GitHub secret. I'm not going to share my secret on a, on a YouTube channel, so uh, but you you understand the concept of secrets. And it will then be it will use my trigger binding here, which has the variables for the GitHub URL and whatnot, uh, the trigger template, which declares my GitHub URLs and everything like that. Simple enough, and I can deploy. Uh, so this will just this kind of just shows you the benefits or how it works. Let me see if I can actually get it to deploy to run something here real quick. Like I should just be able to run the event listener. Uh, let me see here. This should work. Live demos are always fun. Oh, wrong one. I, I named it my Tekton as I preferred to call it that. The namespace, that is. Uh, okay, well, um, anyway, you got to love live demos, right? 
Uh, so what would, what it would do is display if I execute, let me actually go ahead and display the dashboard. So that way you can actually see a good uh, visualization here. So bear with me one second, because I did deploy that dashboard. Okay, oh, uh, that's in a different pod. Um, ah, here we go. You can actually expose it simply by doing Ah, so it's like changing as I, oh, here we go. Ah, it's not exporting the way I wanted it to. Well, this is fun. Oh, here we go. All right, there we go. And so here we'd have the dashboard. We, we can see the pipeline runs, the tasks, the... I deployed it in the wrong namespace, so apologies for that. The different uh, deployments, the task runs, the custom runs that I've created, the event listeners, the triggers. I don't have. I can use the TKN CLI if I prefer to live in the CLI in my dashboard. That's perfectly fine. Uh, but I also have the, uh, this nice uh, dashboard if I don't want to live in terminal. So I have both options available. Uh, in the interest of time, rather than having people watch me debug, but I will update with the GitHub uh, to show you what I have deployed so you can follow along. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and give Muriel a chance to show her Argo CD. All right, perfect. So let me go ahead and share the window over here. Thank you very much, Jay. Um, so I do have a combination of a couple things that we're going to try live, but then also we've got a fallback just in case. Um, so I'm here essentially in, in my uh, workstation. It's sort of my, my web-based workstation that I have for being able to interact with our Argo cluster. So just to start, uh, essentially when we're looking at um, the configuration that's laid out or the simulation is, that I have one of my main clusters here, which is going to be the primary cluster running those Argo CD components. Um, and then also we have two application clusters, this uh, Argo app cluster, and then also a brand new cluster that we're gonna try to deploy to. Uh, so if we wanted to take a look right now at some of the workloads that are running within the Argo cluster uh, itself, I'm gonna pull this up and we have everything here in the Argo CD namespace. You can see we've got our application controller, application sets, and some other components here that are running. Um, along with, you can see here this guestbook UI and I'll get back to that as well uh, in just a little bit. So you can see here some of these different components that exist within the Argo world. Um, but if we wanted to now make sure that we're using the right cluster, um, So I'm here in the cluster itself. So if I run this, All right, so you can see here that I have my Argo uh, applications, application sets, and app projects that are now part of these custom resource definitions. So if we look at that, uh, it's over here as well. Now we're going to look at the actual applications themselves. So you can see we have this very Kubernetes-centric method of being able to interact with the Argo CD server. So if you wanted to use a lot of these native commands, you are able to do that. We have the boutique, and this you can see even the health status. This one is degraded, but we have these other two that are synced and healthy. 
And if we wanted to go in and describe this application that has been set up, um, you can see that now you have very similar definitions to the ones that you would use for being able to uh, manage your actual deployments and so on of your application logic. So you can actually even, you know, use Argo to manage Argo since we have all of these same constructs. So it's kind of this infinite loop, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, so now we are going to attempt to add this new cluster. As I mentioned, we have um, actually, so here, let me go back into Argo CD. You have your command line tool. Um, and if we wanted to see some of the different commands here that are available for Argo CD, um, you've got a lot of these uh, uh, things that are available to be able to um, manage your actual Argo, interact with the server. So I've already logged into this server that I have set up. Um, so if I wanted to do, say, Argo CD app, then you can see a list of the applications here. Um, similar to that Argo CD cluster list. So you can see that I have two clusters that are set up right now. The native, which is in cluster, so it's uh, the actual cluster that Argo is deployed to, and then this other remote cluster, so to speak, the Argo app cluster. So you could just essentially build out a collection of all of the different clusters that have been set up um, to be managed by Argo. So now we're going to attempt to add that new cluster in, which is that cluster that I've just created. So to be able to do that, and of course, this is just one method of being able to interact with Argo CD, which is this a little bit more of like command based. Uh, essentially, uh, what this would look like as you're running in production is you would have various YAMLs and, and configuration, configurations defined in your code, and we'll look at that in a moment. Um, but if we did want to add in that new cluster, we would do uh, add new cluster. And essentially, you can see we've just got some service accounts and roles and so on that are being created in the new cluster. And now this has been added in. So when we go back into our Argo CD cluster list, you can see we have both the, the Argo app cluster and this new cluster in here. There are no applications. It's not being monitored just yet. Um, so if we wanted to be able to create an app um, via the command line, and actually, let me update it so that we are using this here for the destination server. Um, and we're just going to deploy into the default namespace, just keeping this really basic for now. Um, there are actually various sample applications that are available on the Argo project site. So I'm going to, uh, hopefully it's showing up, I'm going to page over here to get, but when we look at these example apps, because each of these folders is set up with the actual YAML and deployments and so on, and some of them with Helm and Customize, essentially all you really need to do, I don't have pull or push access or anything to this, this repository um, itself, but because those YAMLs are there, I can just point to that folder and path as the source for the actual application define within Argo here what the destination server is. So you can see we have the repository, we have the path, we have this destination server, the destination namespace, um, which by default, the namespace should already exist, but there are also a variety of different flags and options if you wanted to have it auto-generate the namespace for you. Uh, and we can just go ahead and try to create that. So let's do this. And so now we've got this application Helm guestbook created. So, um, oh, actually I, I did not go into the application tile. So you can see, oh, so it just showed up this Helm guestbook. So these, this is the actual Argo CD um, application interface or the, the, the dashboard. I have a few applications that I've created previously. Um, I've got this remote guestbook, uh, this guestbook and cluster. And you can see here, um, is uh, the brand new Helm guestbook that I just created. So it's missing and out of sync. Um, so what I'm gonna go ahead and do is set up a sync. And this sync can also, so basically I'm essentially synchronizing the manifests uh, into the repository. I'm set up right now by default just to do the manual, but of course this can be set up to sync at an automated basis so that it's just pulling the repo for any changes that might be happening. 
Again, this is very much centered on that deployment side of things where a lot of the CI is going to be happening and the, the CI and the builds and so on are going to be happening before this point. So it's mostly once that manifest lands in that destination directory. But now you can see this is healthy. It's synced. Um, we have a few different views here in this dashboard. As I mentioned, this ships out of the box with Argo when you do your baseline installation. Um, and you can see for each of these, there's a source, a destination. Uh, and when you're looking at being able to do just multi-cluster management, that's where things like having customized and having some of these other templating structures put into place to manage your say dev and production and staging environments or multiple cluster footprints that are distributed as well. So you have a few different views here. You have this sort of project view, and then you also have a little bit of a high level view if we wanted to say what's in sync, what's out of sync, what's healthy and what's not healthy. Um, and you can see here with this boutique application, um, you know, I, I actually hadn't intended for it to be in an unhealthy state. When I first deployed it, it was more of my cluster sizing issue, but it actually is really helpful for demonstration purposes because now you can see how Argo CD having this very, um, Kubernetes centric and integrated point of view, you can actually get visibility into the system using the same type of uh, constructs and objects that um, you would be accustomed to. So you can see here, we have this deployment status, we can see the application health and so on. And then we can actually also see where we have some services that are actually experiencing issues. So if we wanted to go in here and actually see some events and logs and so on, then we're able to do that as well. So let me actually just pop over here and uh, I'm gonna wrap this up soon just because I know we wanted to save uh, five minutes or so for questions, but I will go back in here to my workloads. Um, uh, I see, okay, my ad service is broken. Um, something that you know you, you wouldn't wanna do in production or another environment. I'm like, let me just delete this and see what will happen. Um, so I'm gonna delete this. We'll come back to this one in just a second. But what I also wanted to show, so those were a few methods of being able to um, add, uh, uh, to add an application. Of course, you are also able to add an application here through the UI where you go in and you can create a, another app, another guest book, so on. But one thing that I, uh, the project name and so on, and one thing that is also great about being able to add this through the dashboard is you have the native ability to be able to also see the YAML that's being created. So even though you're using the UI based method, you can also now have this um, as a reference for the future. So say, say you wanted to say, well, let me, let me go through the UI for the first time. I'm not sure of all of the different parameters and so on. You can build this out, have the YAML, use that as a template for the future. Uh, and of course, this is going to be now part of that CRD and that actual definition um, within Kubernetes. So you can always output that as well. Um, so that's uh, one piece. And then the final is looking at this other method of, of now, actually, we're gonna look at the new one, of now being able to have this definition for that pipeline. We just saw that within the UI, but now I have this here for an application that we are going to be deploying into this new cluster. So this is that new cluster that we had just, that um, was, was sort of like newly added into Argo CD. Um, I've got this in the repository. Um, you know, we've got some information like the namespace and the server, the source, uh, and the target revision. That's actually the branch that I'm going to be using because I, I want to have this just pull off of a specific branch. You can have some other parameters as well. Um, and essentially now what I'm going to do is we'll take that YAML and say, um, I'm going to make sure that I'm using the Argo cluster and deploying into that namespace. Um, and now I'm just going to apply this, uh, you know, much like I would, um, you know, another deployment and so on. And so now, okay, you can see that I've created this new um, application. And if I go back in here, oh, so if I go back in here, I click that a little bit too quickly, but you can see we have this new boutique prod um, configuration that was just applied. Um, so I'm going to just synchronize all of these. 
manually uh, once again. Uh, and as you can see, this boutique application is uh, syncing once more. And actually, if I go back here and refresh for that cluster, essentially what should, should happen is those two um, deployments that I just deleted are now back again because it's taking that default YAML and saying, okay, I'm going to sync. So even though I went in here and deleted it, it's using that repo as a source of truth to deploy it again. Um, and right now, essentially, I can go and debug the switch. It just needs more resources on the cluster. Uh, so that, that was just kind of a very quick uh, demo at looking at some ways of being able to interact with Argo CD and how that really looks into loops into the Kubernetes point centric point of view. Um, so I think from here, um, I guess maybe we can open it up for any questions. Okay, great. We have a few in the chat. <clears throat> Let me back up a little bit. Okay. To containerize, do we use, oh gosh, OmniDeck or Docker, any container platform? Uh, so for containerization, I believe we can just use whatever. So if you want to use Docker, if you want to use Podman, if you want to use anything like that, as long as it creates like the, um, the uh, an OCI image, it follows that OCI image standard for the runtime, then you're fine. Um, I personally use Podman on my machine, so I don't think, uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but you can use anything. In fact, we mentioned on a little later how you can use Canico to build containers in the cloud uh, in lieu of Docker, so. All right. Okay, this is a long one, get ready. Okay. <laughs> I have implemented CI CD using Tecton and Argo CD while creating a pipeline where I am working right now. What I've noted is that it takes more time while building images from Docker files, specifically JavaScript based front end application, than any other tool when compared to Tecton. Is there any recommendation on how it can be improved? I'm using Canico for building image. Secondly, while running pipeline, it takes a huge amount of underlying node disk space. While checking it with Prometheus and Grafana, it can be noted that it consumes close to 90% node disk space. Is there any way to improve? So I think on this, without maybe knowing a little bit more about your specific environment, it may be difficult to debug why this one in particular is taking a little bit longer. I think if maybe you take a few other if you've got similar applications or similar um, you know, images that you're building that are using roughly the same stack and framework and so on, and if those are building a lot faster, then I, I think maybe dialing back and, and going kind of in the stepwise manner to look at like maybe there are some dependencies or something like that that are creating uh, this really huge footprint. Um, so I, I think it's mostly looking at how to be able to optimize and build like a slightly leaner image. Um, I, I know that, and I, I don't have it handy, but I think there are some guides online that talk about how, how to be able to streamline streamline your builds and streamline your images, maybe looking at the base images themselves. So there may be a few different things that you can do for looking at optimizing that build, that portion of the build itself, because I think that might address both of those, is that maybe there are some things that are happening in the background or some dependencies that aren't necessary for that actual application, like how can you minimize and make it a little bit more modular, for example. All right. Another problem I faced is if pipeline is triggered more than once at a time, is there any way to create a queue of triggers so that once a pipeline run is completed, then the other and the queue should be triggered? Um, and then I guess I would answer, and, and <clears throat> sorry, maybe Jay, Jay would um, pipe in for tech, Tecton as well, but uh, the short answer is yes. So they, there are abilities to be able to create these stepwise dependencies or like these triggers based off of events so that if you do have something that is required to run before another, then you would be able to um, define that sequence. Yeah, you can usually somehow link the final step of a trigger or of a pipeline to trigger the first step of a, another pipeline. Uh, and you can usually use event finding or there's a lot of different ways you can execute it, but it is doable. And there are, there, there are some demos like in the Tecton community uh, specifically on that use case. 
All right. Well, we are at time. I know there were a couple other questions left. If Mariel and Jason want to pop their handles into the chat, um, then maybe y'all can follow up with them after the show. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Jason and Muriel for an awesome presentation. Um, lots of great interaction and conversation. And um, I'll leave this up for just a minute while everybody logs out so that y'all can be sure to get their info and follow up with them. But thanks again, both of you. And we'll see y'all again for another live webinar tomorrow. Thank you everybody for letting us uh, spend some time with you. All right. Thank you all. And for the questions that we didn't answer, yes, feel, feel free to reach out to us and we'll we'll try to circle back on, on any of those items. 100%. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, all.